All right, well, look, the crash of 87 was interesting, really interesting, because it was a crash without consequence, um, or not or without big consequence, a crash that essentially could be ignored in the end. Um, and when you go back and you read the literature of the time, a lot of really smart people were saying, now we have the Depression. You know, that John Kenneth Galbraith was saying that this is the crash of 29 all over again. Uh, and now comes the Depression. It was just sort of assumed that if there's a crash, then there's a Depression. And what happened there was a dramatic illustration of the disconnect that had occurred between financial markets and the real economy. And the financial markets had this life of their own that maybe, maybe was and maybe wasn't tied to whatever was going on in the real economy. Um, why that is? is I think probably a deep question. Uh, part of it is the, just the size of the uh, component of the financial markets that was pure casino was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, as opposed to the, the part of the financial markets that's engaged in allocating capital for real productive uses, real productive ends. Um, but I think what you take away, what I took away from it, at the time, I mean, I was in the middle of it. I was actually sitting in the Solomon Brothers equity block trading department, watching it happen when it happened, and wrote about it. Uh, and I was working at Solomon Brothers. Uh, but uh, I think that there are a couple of things that were sort of distinctive about it and worth noting. One is, I think it's the first case where the market collapses in part because tools have been created that the people who are using them don't fully understand, financial tools. And in this case, it's portfolio insurance, uh, which is in using, the, the, the basic idea is you use these things that have been created and are now traded called financial futures, S&P futures, to hedge yourself. And the way you do it is you sell it as the market goes down. And if you think about it, if you start selling it as the market goes down, you sell more and more as the market goes down. At some point, you've completely sold out your equity exposure. So in theory, at some point, you've, 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 you've put a cap on your losses by doing this. And a lot of people had bought into this idea of how, this is how you hedge. You hedge dynamically by selling futures. Well, that works if one person is doing it. If everybody's doing it, uh, then what happens is the market goes down and everybody sells. So the market goes down some more and they sell even more. And a doomsday machine is created. Uh, so here was, I think, the first example of uh, a new effect on financial technology having these consequences that hadn't really been considered before. before. And, um, and after that, the idea of portfolio insurance was kind of doomed. Uh, I mean, the, the firm that created it basically went out of business. Uh, and uh, so that, but, but, that's the that, that there was a specific lesson about portfolio insurance, but the general one about, about financial tools, well, that would replay itself over and over and over again in the next 20 years. Um, I think the other, the other thing uh, that um, came out of that period, and this isn't so much the lessons that, that we learn, we as a people learn, because I don't think we as a people learn anything of it from it, uh, but what the financial markets learned was that this, this sort of volatility, this sort of, this sort of surface calamity, is actually not a bad thing. It's a huge opportunity. That the more it moves, the more we can make if we know how to, if we know how to manage the volatility. Because what happened on the Solomon Brothers trading floor was quite interesting uh, that day. Um, and it's slightly technical, but I'm gonna try to explain it. Uh, when, when the stock market collapses, the bond market goes, goes up because people think we're gonna have a depression, so they're gonna have to lower interest rates, so bonds go up. Uh, the people who traded government bonds on the Solomon trading floor thought, stock market's collapsing, let's make a big bet. They bought, what um, was a big bet at the time, it sounds trivial now, $2 billion of the current US Treasury bond, the 30-year Treasury bond, the new 30-year Treasury bond, and thinking that that would just skyrocket. The quants who sat beside them, who became John Merriweather, who were John Merriweather's long-term capital management, but they were still on the Solomon Brothers trading floor, saw that 
the people who were thinking about things in cruder ways uh, were, were creating a distortion within the U.S. Treasury bond market. By buying up all these the new 30-year Treasury bond, they were creating this huge gap in price in return between the current 30-year Treasury bond and the 30-year Treasury bond that was no longer current, that was you know, of three months earlier maturity. And so what they did was buy the old, the old Treasury bond and sell short the new one because everybody was flooding. And they made a fortune in the price discrepancy uh, that, that opened up when it went back to normal. So that was the big thing that happened on that trading floor from, because they, they, they made the most money. And they did it by observing relationships between securities without regard to the, what was happening in, in the larger world. And the pre, their premise was these relationships always retur, re, kind of revert to their, their mean. They, they revert to normal. So if it gets extreme, bet on it, and it'll come back. This would later be the source of their doom. But, uh, but so that was, it laid the seeds for other things. Mm -hmm.